We're going to talk about um, pulmonary preoperative risk stratification. Of course, my name is Jesse. Um, so this is my outline today of what I plan on talking about. Of course, our introduction. Uh, um, physiology, patient-related risk factors, uh, procedure-related risk factors, um, preoperative risk assessment, and risk reduction strategies. So quick question. Which is more common, an incidence of post-operative pulmonary, um, pulmonary complications or the incidence of post-operative cardiac complications? Clue. <laughs> um, so, so there was a study that was done um, that looked at between over a 10-year period of uh, over 2,200 patients uh, undergoing elective abdominal surgery. It was a retrospective study, um, and it pretty much showed that um, it looked at the risk of both, the, the risk of cardiac complications and pulmonary complications. And it pretty much showed that pulmonary complications had a significant higher risk um, than cardiac complications, um, despite what cardiologists may tell you. Um, and there was a significant longer hospital stay, 27 days as opposed to 10 days. So pulmonary risk actually is a really big component of post-operative um, care, and it should not be taken lightly. Another um, question. So Mr. Doe develops a fever, 103.3 for nine days post-operative post-operatively. His chest x-ray shows a consolidation of his right lower lobe. Is this a post-pulmonary complication, post-operative pulmonary complication? Yes. yes, true. It is. Why is that a question? It's mostly because there's actually not a, def a, a real good definition. There's no precise definition of what a post-operative pulmonary complication is. Um, so if you look at the studies, you know, the range of, of pulmonary complications in the literature range from 2 to 70 percent. And it depends on a, a number of, of things. P the patient selection that they used, the procedure reinformed, and what was defined as post-operative pulmonary complications. So some studies may just say a post-operative uh, pneumonia that they saw post-operatively just would be the, um, um, a complication. But what if the person ended up being reintubated or staying on the vent for longer than like 48 hours? What happened if they developed atelectasis? So because of that, that's why there's a significant range on what uh, pulmonary complications are in the literature if you do a literature search. So what are the general definitions of a post-operative pulmonary complication, PPC? Um, pretty much it is pulmonary complications that are clinically significant. So this range from atelectasis infection, where it's bronchitis or pneumonia, bronchospasms, so those people were, of course, um, of asthma, COPD, they have some bronchospasms, um, PEs, um, any exacerbation of their underlying lung disease. So if they have ILD, um, asthma, or anything like that, if they get exacerbation um, postoperatively, it's considered a postoperative complication. Um, respiratory failure and ARDS, prolonged ventilation. So all these are considered um, postoperative um, pulmonary complications. So physiology, what do we expect? So we know that neuromuscular blockage will not only, it will block all your muscles, um, most notably the diaphragm. Our diaphragm is one of our most notable muscles in our body, and it's one of the main problems that can lead to a um, decrease our FRC. So when we give neuromuscular blockers, anesthetics, we get this uh, diaphragmatic dysfunction. This diaphragmatic dysfunction causes a decrease in FRC. What else causes FRC of decrease? Supine position. Of course, when we stand up, because of the effect of gravity, our diaphragm tends to flatten. We have an increase in our, our lung volumes. Um, by laying supine, we're, our body is perpendicularly aligned with gravity, and that increases some of our intra-abdominal pressures. Our diaphragm tends to become cephalad and moves up, and then because of that, you have a decrease in your lung volumes. This also decreases your FRC. Pain, because when we're in pain, we don't want to take these deep breaths. We're not taking these deep breaths. We also have a decrease in our FRC. What happens with this decrease in FRC? We have increased risk of atelectasis, pneumonias, and VQ mismatch. Why is this? Because we have um, microatelectasis leads to microatelectasis um, is pretty much it's because um, the lungs are not are perfused but not ventilated because they're Perfused and not ventilated, we have a, D, a VQ mismatch. This D, VQ mismatch, when we see people postoperatively in a hypoxemic, hypoxemic, that's probably what is happening. It's just this microadalysis that's happening because of the decrease in FRC. 
And this is more of a graphical representation of what I'm saying. Like we can just look at the different effects on the diaphragm of the supine position, the in induction of um, anesthesia, paralysis, um, surgical placement on, on the table. So all of these stuff decrease our FRC, um, prone to microatelectasis, and which will also make you more prone to having hypoxemia. Um, and we also know from studies that uh, thoracic and upper abdominal surgeries leads to a reduction in our vital capacity by 60% and our function and our FRV, FRC by 30%. And our narcotics also lead to um, decrease in respiratory drive, cough, and uh, impairment of our mucociliary clearance. Did you go put hide? <laughs> Oh man. Do I got 15 minutes? I, y'all yeah, bad. So, um, it's okay, I only got 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard stop software update. I'm an immigrant too, you know. <laughs> All right, before the rude interruption. Um, so, so, um, well, so we was talking about um, the decrease in um, vital capacity in FRC. So Reamer, in the 1970s, this was a study that they pretty much took it from where everybody gets that conclusion off of the, the decrease in the FRC and the vital capacity. As we can see, um, in the f 24 hours following the upper abdominal surgery, the FRC decreased by 30%. Um, and around the same time, the vital capacity decreased by, by 60%. But you also notice that there was a trend towards uh, normalcy by day seven. So by day seven, most of these, um, the FRC and the vital capacity tended to come back to a, a normal preoperative levels. Risk factors. So we can divide risk factors into two different categories. Patient-related risk factors and surgical slash procedure-related risk factors. Patient-related risk factors. So all these has been pretty much shown to be a risk, uh, a risk factor for um, a post-operative uh, pulmonary complication. So age greater than 50, ASA class greater than two, um, COPD, functional dependent status, um, uncontrolled asthma, CHF, um, obesity, and OSA. We're gonna talk about that. Patient-related risk factor number one, age. So pretty much in 2006, the ACP pretty much had their systematic review and looking at the pulmonary, post-operative pulmonary complications, um, and they looked at age. So what they found was that age greater than 50 was an important risk factor for post-operative pulmonary complications. And if you look at the odds ratio, um, it pretty much showed that it, age um, increased linearly, risk increased increase linearly with age. So um, people 50 and older had an odds ratio of one, and then it progressively got worse as they got older. So, I mean, we already know this. When people play, you know, when you have the older individual who thinks they're young and they're playing soccer with you and they can't run, this is pretty much God's way of telling them that they have a risk factor. I'll trade you. <laughs> Patient related risk factor number two. <laughs> um, albumin and BUN. So uh, if you look at uh, this study by Arizona, and uh, you'll see this name pretty commonly, um, it showed, and it was a study by the National Veterans um, Surgical Risk Study, and it looked at, it was a prospective cohort study that looked at over 81,000 patients. And it pretty much showed that albumin less than three was a strong indicator of a post-operative um, respiratory failure. And respiratory failure was defined as um, failure to wean off the vent over 48 hours. So people who became intubated and they couldn't actually get off the vent for 48 hours, um, that was considered a post-operative respiratory failure. And they had an odds ratio of 2.5. Um, and serum albumin, serum albumin was also an important, day, important um, marker or for morbidity and mortality. Um, and BUN, of course, greater than 30. So if their, creatinine, if their kidneys were actually 
not in the best uh, performance. It also was a, 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 a risk factor for postoperative pulmonary complications. Um, and this, uh, of course, you know, I know everybody's seen this name before because we use this risk factor, uh, we use this risk index calculator a lot for our perioperative uh, risk um, stratification. So this is where the study, this study is where that albumin that we use in that calculator in the BUN comes from. Patient-related risk factor number three, ASA. Um, there are five ASA classes, of course, and it's a subjective kind of assessment based on what we think people's, um, well, how healthy we think people are. So, of course, ASA of one is for normal people, and ASA of five is pretty much a merry-bound patients who are not expected to survive. So, uh, you know, we, we look at what their history is, how they look in, in at that moment, and we kind of assign them uh, an ASA classification. Um, what they did was they pretty much, uh, in this study, pretty much the the same study, um, ACP study in 2006, what they did is they took ASA categories two and lower and two and higher, and then they looked at the, the odds ratio of that, and then they also looked at three and higher, three and lower, and looked at the odds ratio of that, and they pretty much came to the conclusion that an ASA class greater than two had a almost five, five, um, higher, five, percent high, five times higher risk um, which makes sense because when we're looking at patients and, you know, when we're doing Bronx and we're looking at patients, we, we the sicker they are, the higher ASA class we're going to get. So these people who have a higher ASA class for, from baseline are going to be pretty sicker. So we expect them to have a risk factor for um, postoperative pulmonary complications. So it makes actually um, sense just if you think about it that way. Patient-related risk factor number four was COPD. So Gupta, which is another familiar name that we know from the Gupta risk calculator, um, what he did was he took this national database that they have, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program database, which had over 450,000 patients, and it looked at COPD as a um, COPD as an um, COPD as a risk factor for postoperative pneumonia, reintubations, and failure to wean. And pretty much shows that it was it had a um, overall odds ratio of 2.3, which was adjusted for COPD being an important risk factor for um, postoperative pulmonary complications. Um, and if you look at older studies, which pretty much already told us that COPD was a pretty significant risk factor, it, the older studies pretty much showed that COPD has a, almost a six times higher chance of post pulmonary um, complications, postoperative pulmonary complications. Um, and if you look at also those older studies, and they look, they show um, um, what are some of the risk factors for uh, postoperative pulmonary ca complications. And some of the older studies looked at age, so age greater than um, 65. COP people who have COPD with age greater than 65 was a significant risk factor. Smoking, so greater than 40 pack smoking history was a, a significant risk factor. And a laryngeal height of four centimeters, which I didn't try to dwell into how they got the laryngeal height of four centimeters. Um, so what level of pulmonary function will surgery, surgery be contraindicated? So we had this study that looked at the criteria for fitness in patients with uh, and anesthesia in patients with COPD. Um, it was a, um, a pretty much, it, it pretty much showed uh, that there was no level at which surgery will be contraindicated and you must weigh the uh, benefits with all. You must weigh the harms and the benefits of surgery. What it did is it looked at patients. It looked at 12 patients. So it was a really small study, and it looked at these patients who had a FEV less than one liter. And it pretty much showed that um, only three out of the 15 surgeries were show, uh, associated with post-operative pulmonary complications, but no deaths occurred. So despite them having a low FEV less than one liter, they still didn't have a significant mortality. Of course, it wasn't a big study, um, but it it pretty much let the groundwork to say, okay, even if they do have COPD and they do have a low FEV1, that shouldn't preclude them from any kind of surgical procedure. You just got to weigh what the risk and the benefits of that surgical procedure at that time. Patient-related rel risk factor number five, asthma. So if you look at the um, Annals of Internal Medicine, the 2006 uh, systematic review, um, you'll see that there were four studies that they looked at. And only one study actually compared patients with asthma to patients without asthma. And the, um, the total number of patients they looked at were about 900. And the percent of post-operative pulmonary complications was around 3%. And this was actually the same for all studies. So asthma was not a significant um, risk factor for post-operative pulmonary complications. 
and bronchospasm was actually rarely associated with, with serious morbidity. But when you look a little bit further, one of the studies they looked at was perioperative respiratory complication with patients with asthma. Um, so this was about a, a Mayo study over 20 years that looked at um, at, least surg uh, at least surgical, they looked at all patients who had surgical procedures involving general anesthetics um, or any kind of um, um, anesthetics. And it pretty much uh, shows that, if you look at here, I'll put the graph, um, patients who, had, who went to the ER or who had an office visit within thir uh, 30 days before in their operation, they actually had a 28 um, they had actually had 20, 28 more times likely to have a bronchospasm during um, the post-operative, perioperative period. So, and people who was actually admitted to the hospital within 30 days had 75 times higher incidence of bronchospasm during the perioperative period. So that kind of much pretty much came to the conclusion where if you look even um, at up to date and, and ACP, they pretty much says, um, you should look at asthma as more of controlled versus uncontrolled. So if somebody it has asthma as itself, it's not a risk factor, but if somebody has poorly controlled asthma, it's still considered a significant risk factor for a, um, um, a complication, postoperative complication. Patient-related risk factor number six is OSA. Um, we, um, we, we already know just because of physiology that OSA has a higher incidence of IC transfers, higher length of stays, hypoxemia, atelectasis, and, and pneumonia. Um, it's estimated that we under-recognize OSA a lot in our patient population, and an estimated 25% of patients undergoing surgery do have um, OSA. Um, and this was also looked at a study in 2011 where 3.4 million surgical and 2.6 million ortho patients from ICD database was looked at, and OSA had an odds ratio of 1.9 um, so 1.9 times higher of having respiratory failure, of course, what we're saying, respiratory failure um, by um, our guidelines now is pretty much um, required mechanical ventilation greater than two days and aspiration pneumonia. Um, obesity. So you will think that ob obesity is actually not a risk factor from the sy system systematic review in 2006, but you know, you will think it would be just because of some of the same problems with Obesity happens with just the with the FRC, so you're you know that all the excess weight is decreasing your lung volume, so you still get that microatelectasis and that hypoxemia. The same thing you get with the supine position. The same thing you get with the uh, with the the, um, the anesthesiology. So you will think with all these as a combination of facts that you actually have um, obesity as a risk factor for postoperative pulmonary complication, but. Um, it was not um, from the systematic review in the, uh, from the ACP in 2006. There was actually obesity was not actually a risk factor for um, uh, postoperative pulmonary complication. Post um, patient related risk factor number seven is uh, pulmonary hypertension. So in 2011, of course, uh, from respiratory medicine, um, they, there was a journal that they, they published where they looked at regardless of what the WHO type was, so group one to group five, didn't matter which one. It, it was, they looked at patients with pulmonary hypertension and they found that pulmonary hypertension was a significant, was a significant risk factor for post-operative pulmonary complications. Um, and what they did was they, they, they um, all the people who went for surgical for surgery, they had patients with swans, and they looked at people who had a mean arterial pressure, of course, that uh, was not indicative of pulmonary hypertension less than 25, and people who did have pulmonary hypertension with a, P, um, a mean pulmonary arterial pressure greater than 25, and they showed that not only was you have a higher risk of um, post-operative pulmonary complications, but you had a higher rate of post-operative um, CHF, delayed extubation, you had in-hospital mortality, cardiac arrhythmia, stroke, respiratory failure, which was actually, of course, the most common, um, morbidity, um, renal dysfunction, and sepsis. So pulmonary retention actually not only caused just um, post-operative pulmonary complications, but a slew of a, lo a lot of other things. Um, so we also looked at the impact of pulmonary hypertension um, on the outcomes of uh, non-cardiac surgery. So it studied 145 surgical patients with pulmonary hypertension. And um, they excluded the patients that had pulmonary hypertension that was secondary to left heart disease. And um, pretty much uh, it looked at um, what are the predictors for mortality and morbidity in these pulmonary hypertension patients. So people who had a history of PE, um, New York Heart Association class two symptoms, 
and uh, what if they were undergoing any intermediate or high risk surgery and if their duration of anesthesia was greater than three hours um, all these were um, independent independent predictors of short-term morbidity um, patient related risk factor number eight heart failure um, so I don't have much on this because it, uh, we already know heart failure um, is a risk factor for not only uh, pulmonary but also cardiac complications, post-operative cardiac complications, and um, the same. Uh, most of um, the risk factors came from the 2006 ACP review, where it showed that um, th there was a 2.9 odds ratio of having increased risk of um, post-operative complications with pa patients with heart failure, and it was actually higher than people with COPD. Smoking. Um, so uh, there was a meta-analysis that, that looked at um, that found that smokings have an increased risk of post-operative pulmonary complications, and um, it showed that um, it was a stronger risk if you smoke more than 20 pack years per day. And not so, but it was not just pulmonary risk that um, you were significant at risk for. It's also if you continue smoking after your surgery, you're also at risk for general morbidity, wound complications, infections neurological complications and you had a higher rate of being admitted to the ICU. So then it brings a question, smoking sensation. At what level, at when should you stop smoking before you should be able to go undergo a, a, some kind of surgical procedure? So what, what uh, Mills found was that patients who stopped smoking at least four weeks prior to, um, uh, prior to their surgical procedure actually had a lower risk of post-operative pulmonary complications and this risk improved 19% for each week that you stopped smoking. So smoking was a significant risk factor and trying to get them to stop prior to surgery was actually, um, um, was actually s uh, reduced the incidence of the post-operative pulmonary complications. Um, so we're gonna talk about procedure-related risk factors. Um, so which one of these do you think uh, has not been associated with increase in post-operative pulmonary complications? It's actually a question. So surgical expertise. All these are uh, surgical site, duration of surgery, type of anesthesia, and the type of neuromuscular blockage is all types of procedure-related risk factors. Location, location, location. So location is actually a very <laughs> big, <laughs> location is actually one of the main um, um, surgi surgical-related risk factors when it comes to uh, um, post-operative pulmonary complication. So surgical site is the most common and most important r surgical um, risk factor for post-operative pulmonary complications. Uh, more complications will occur, of course, in the upper, upper thoracic and upper abdominal surgeries um, compared to the lower abdominal surgeries. Um, of course, higher risk um, with uh, neurosurgeries, head and neck surgeries, and AAA repairs. Um, so surgical risk is actually inverse related to the distance from the diaphragm. So I came up with this last night. So general rule of thumb, the lower you go, the less dangerous it gets. That is only for post-operative pulmonary complications. Um, duration of surgery was another important risk factor. Any surgery that was actually um, greater than three hours had a significant higher um, incidence of uh, post-operative pulmonary complications. I um, mean, this was from a study. There was actually one study that that um, there was actually numerous studies, but one study that I, that I found that showed that. Um, um, the risk factor for post-operative just pneumonia in 502 patients had an incidence of 8% in the surgeries that lasted less than two hours and 40% for procedures that lasted more than four hours. So surgeries that, that, can, that are prolonged just has a higher incidence for that. Um, and I, I, th you, you can make some argument that it's probably because of the kind of anesthesia that you use. Um, whether they uh, address that for co-founders, I wasn't able to really look at. Um, but there also is a higher incidence of post-operative complications depending on the kind of um, neuromuscular blockade they use. So um, there was a higher risk of pancronium, which is a longer acting neuromuscular blockade than it is for shorter acting ones. And you had a residual diaphragmatic dysfunction. You had impaired muso mucociliary clearance. And of course we know that with the diaphragmatic dysfunction, you have that shorter, um, you decrease your lung volumes and decrease your FRC, so you're more risk for having atelectasis, so it just makes sense. Um, and the data also suggests that the residual neuromuscular block 
is a common complication in the post anesthesia care um, places with approximately like 40% of patients that still exhibit a train of four less than one um, um, in the post anesthesiology the, P the PACU pretty much. Um, and of course we know that this is associated with impaired pharyngeal function, um, weakness of your upper abdominal muscles, your diaphragm, and you have an increased risk of aspiration. The type of surgical related risk factor number four, the type of anesthesia. So a study by Rogers um, that looked at the post-operative mortality and morbidity with uh, epidural um, or spinal anesthesiology, uh, anesthesia. Um, so it was a meta-analysis that looked over almost 10,000 patients that found that patients that received neural axial blockade had almost a 40% reduction in the post-operative pulmonary complication, which was looked at, which was defined in their study as pneumonia, and almost had a 59% reduction in respiratory depression compared to, to those getting general anesthesia. So, um, recommending somebody get, um, if you can, recommend to somebody who can get like a spinal or uh, regional kind of neuroaxial blockade had a, a significant decrease in your risk of getting um, post-operative pulmonary complications. So of course, whenever possible, regional block it, regional nerve block would be better. Um, and this is kind of looking at um, the uh, the ACP, looking at the procedure-related risk factors. As we can see, if you look at um, um, the studies that they use to get some of their um, their odds at ratio and 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 look at the risk factors. Of course, the higher you went from the diaphragm, the higher your risk was of having a post-operative pulmonary complication. Uh, if you had general anesthesiology, of course, that was also a significant risk um, for post-operative pulmonary complication. So some objective data. Um, PFTs, true or false? All patients undergoing pulmonary preoperative evaluation should at least have a baseline PFT. Okay. Um, so the role of PFTs. Um, so um, perioperative PFTs do not predict um, the incidence of postoperative pulmonary complications, so they should not be ordered routinely. Uh, uh, of course, the same study, the 2006 ACP, um, spirometry, spirometry did not did not was not a risk did not show people who can actually have postoperative pulmonary complications. And it should never be used as a, as a way of denying people with surgery because what it really does is it really kind of tells you what you already know. So if you, if you saw somebody who has asthma or um, COPD and somebody told you, okay, we wanted, to get, we wanted to know if this person's safe for surgery, just based on their symptoms alone, you can see if they're uncontrolled or, or controlled, which is what most of the studies looked at. Are they controlled or uncontrolled? So, you don't really need PFTs at that time to tell you if they're uncontrolled or controlled. You could just base it off of the patient's symptoms. So they felt like just at, at having this objective data was just more of a waste of money because you already know the answer that you're going to, you, you can tell, you know what the answer is going to be before you actually order the test. So what's the point of ordering the test in the first place? Um, so, um, so, uh, so of course, uh, uh, the postoperative pulmonary complications following abdominal surgery. They looked at um, the COPD uh, less than 50% predicted, and perioperative PFTs did not predict the risk of um, pulmonary complication. Whereas other risk factors like the length of stay, their ASA class, and the precise type of procedure all were significant um, um, predictors of um, complications. So, and the data did not suggest a a, a level at which PFTs would prohibit somebody from going, undergoing a procedure. Um, so, like I said, it, it pretty much confirms what you already know. If somebody has a disease severity, most of the time clinical, um, clinical, uh, they'll present clinically enough for you to really kind of recognize it. Uh, PFTs, uh, of course, sometimes it could be helpful. At, at, in most of the situations, you can just see if they're controlled or not controlled and make your decision off of that without routinely ordering PFTs on everybody who has. Um, a significant um, who has COPD or, or asthma or whatever other lung disease that they have. Chest x-rays. Um, so, we, so we know chest x-rays pretty much that they looked at, actually there was a study that was done, they looked at 14,000 x-rays and only 140 out of the 14,000 chest x-rays um, had abnormalities that were detected and out of 14 of the 14,000 actually had 
uh, actually had something else significant enough that would have changed management. So that pretty much brings us to the conclusion that chest x-ray should not be routine, routinely ordered and people to evaluate for um, risk for um, post-operative risk. Um, and we know that a chest x-ray, abnormalities in chest x-rays increase with age. So 21% of all preoperative chest x-rays were abnormal. But if you look at people under 50, the rate was only 4.9%. So um, the older you get, the more likely you're, you're to find something abnormal in a chest x-ray. But with that even being said, there was only a small percentage of people who were this abnormality that you will find would have actually changed your change whether they would have had the surgery or not. ABGs. ABGs are useful to help stratify pulmonary risk. True or false? Tricky question, huh? No, no data suggests the use of ABGs to stratify patients. Um, and that comes, and, and, and these are disclaimers. We're, we're, we're talking about non cardiac, so we're not talking about like long reduction surgery. We're not talking about all, um, we're, we're pretty much only talking about like non thoracic surgery. That's where most of this stuff comes from. So, CPETs. And most of these stuff that we're saying is like if you do have it, it can help you out, but it should, you shouldn't order it just to assess the patient for a risk. So uh, that would be a disclaimer. So if you have these objective data, it would be good to look at to really help with um, risk ratification. But what these are, what these people are trying to say is that if you don't have these data, routinely ordering these data in all these patients just to help to risk ratify these patients is not recommended. Um, so CPET. Um, so we often use it in lung reduction surgery, but of course, a systematic review in 2009 by anesthesiology shows that. Um, it looked at the maximum oxygen consumption and the antibiotic threshold um, and, and calculated perioperative, perioperative morbidity and mortality. And it shows that both were predictors of perioperative morbidity and mortality. Um, but they did not look at really um, post-operative pulmonary complications as a risk factor for its own. Um, so it does have some role, but of course we wouldn't order a, a test for everybody who, <laughs> even though it does, it's shown to increase, it, it's shown to be a predictor of, of morbidity and mortality, it should not be ordered on every single patient that you get a consult for for risk assessment, uh, pulmonary risk assessment. So it will be like if so, uh, like a, a scenario where um, when I was reading that, if somebody has some unexplained dyspnea, uh, unexplained dyspnea and they want to undergo some non pulmonary surgery, that you can actually you have evidence to support the fact that you may, you can get a CPT to try to help risk ratify somebody. Um, so, what is the most important thing that you can do perioperatively? History. History, history, history. History, although we've been told a lot of times in medical school, history is significantly important when you're trying to um, risk stratify somebody. Um, so, when we're trying to get a history, we got to pay attention to, of course, our smoking history since we know that's a significant risk factor, occupational exposure their respiratory symptoms. So like I said, you know, is there asthma, COPD, or so forth, so forth? Is it controlled or not? Do, do they have signs of infection, respiratory infection? Um, or do they have limited exercise capacity? Um, screen, screening stuff for, like OSA, since we know it's a significant risk factor. So you can use the stop band questionnaire when you're trying to talk, or talk to people, since we know that um, OSA is so underdiagnosed in the community and it's still a significant risk factor. Physical exam check for vitals, check for, um, take our stethoscope, actually look for like wheezing, ronchi, prolonged respiratory phase, so physical exam, vitals, stuff like that, are they hypoxemic, which is actually one of the things that we look at in our risk factor index, um, stuff like that that can help us risk stratify people. Uh, I went too fast. So we're going to look at our risk prediction tools, um, and pretty much our risk prediction tools um, use perioperative risk um, factors, stuff that we already talked about. They're procedure risk factors or patient-related risk factors, and they use that to estimate the risk of a post-operative pulmonary complication. Um, so we have the CANITS, uh, um, the uh, ERISCAT. So it was a this used a prospective multicenter um, study and looked at all patients undergoing surgical procedures, 59 hospitals were involved in the selection, 
almost 2,500 patients, and they looked at post-operative pulmonary complication, and it showed seven independent risk factors. Um, it also showed a higher 30-day mortality with people who had a post-operative pulmonary complication. Um, seven, the seven uh, risk factors were advanced age, low preoperative oxygenation, respiratory infection within the past month, preoperative um, anemia, upper abdominal surgery, or thoracic surgery, surgery lasting more than two hours, and emergency surgery. And pretty much it gave a risk score to all of these. So it gave a risk score to all of these um, different risk factors. And pretty much it put you into a risk category. So if you had a risk, uh, um, you were low risk if you, if when you added up all your risk um, factors. And if you were less than 26, you had a almost like 2% chance of a post-operative pulmonary complication. Intermediate will be 26 to 44, and you had a 13% chance, of course, a higher risk. Um, greater than 45, you had a 20, a 41% risk factor. So what does this really mean? It pretty much means um, when you calculate these people's risk factors for a post-operative pulmonary complication, and you look at things that you can't change. Unfortunately, we can't change our age, but we can look at it to why people are, um, if they're perioperatively hypoxic, why are they hypoxic? If they have a respiratory infection, should we hold off on the surgery if it's not an emergency and treat the respiratory infection unless they're anemic? Uh, and this was anemia that was less than 10 grams. Should we give them blood transfusions before? So things that we can actually try to work on to try to lower their post-operative risk. So that's what these risk calculators. It helps us be aware of what their risk category is, put us into these risk scores, and then, see, and then, then use these risk scores to see if there's things that we can change. So if we, you could talk to your surgeon, I mean, you can't, I won't, but you could talk to your surgeon <laughs> and see, okay, can you actually try to do the surgery in a quick amount of time um, and see how that goes. Um, so another risk factor is the Arizona, like we talked about before, respiratory risk failure. Um, so what it looked at, it was, a, it was based on, a, um, on a, um, the pretty much the VA surgical quality improvement. It had almost 81,000 um, patients in it predicted pretty much two things. A post-operative respiratory failure, which we talked about, which is defined as having prolonged mechanical ventilation greater than two days. And it also, the next one, the Arizona um, pneumonia index looked at um, chances of having post-operative pneumonia. The study actually excluded women from the study because they said that the women were more healthier. Um, and then it, it looked at all these risks. Type of surgery is a surgery emergency or not. The albumin, which we know was a patient-related risk factor. Um, their BUN, so their, um, how the kidneys are doing, which are we also know is some other patient-related risk factor, their age. And it looked at all this stuff and then also put them into a point uh, system and pretty much looked at if their score, if their score was um, less than 10, their chances of post-operative respiratory failure, like we said, respiratory failure, or mechanical ventilation um, are greater than 48 hours. Um, it pre um, so we looked at um, all of these, put it, got, got a score, and then you could kind of figure out what's the chances of having prolonged ventilation, you know, being on a ventilator for longer than 48 hours. Um, and instead of calculating that, and you have the Arizona post-operative pneumonia risk. Um, so the same researcher that developed a second more complex model, as you can see, it has a, a lot of uh, point systems for everything. And they pretty much looked at data from 160,000 non-cardiac surgeries at 97 medical centers over a period of almost like two years. Um, and it came up with this own point system also and put it into risk categories. And the same concept um, applies um, once we get these risks once we get these risk, perioperative risk factors and we put them into a score, if their score is really high, to have a, their, their chances of postoperative um, pneumonia is pretty significantly high. What can we do to really change these? So we look at things that we can change, like the BUN, if they're creatinine, if, they're, if their BUN is high, if they need, if um, is it emergency, can they stop smoking? Um, so stuff like that, especially if it's an elective surgery. Um, so one of the newer thing, things that came out, of course, was the GUPA, GUPA um, risk index. And it, just, yeah, it uses a GUPA calculator. It's actually readily available online. He made it free for everybody. Um, and he looked at the um, National Surgical Quality Improvement um, 2007 data, which was uh, over 20, 211,000 patients. Um, and it also provides a, uh, a look at post-operative respiratory failure and post-operative pneumonia. So just like the Arizona, cap, um, the Arizona calculator, but as you can tell, when you're looking at at least the post-operative risk of pneumonia, 
they have a lot less um, risk factors to use to calculate theirs. Um, so, um, it has, so the postoperative respiratory failure have five, and the postoperative pneumonia has seven different categories. Um, if you look at a comparison between the two, I think one of the things that most stands out is look at what some of the notable limitations. Uh, so, so the Dupla, they excluded OSA patients and some asthma people with history of, of, of VTEs. And of course, uh, uh, the Arizona excluded almost no females in that. So you can make your own kind of um, analysis from that. But even though the Dupla is a, a, it's a easier calculator to use, I think just excluding a lot of the patients that we see almost all the time with OSA asthma and, and PEs kind of makes it makes it put a, makes me put at least an asterisk next to the group that and makes me want to use even the, the cumbersome Arizona calculator. Um, risk reduction strategies. So perioperative peri true or false. You must stop smoking at least eight weeks before you can rec recommend somebody procedure surgery. True or false? False. Um, I, clearly, we know from the data we showed that um, for if you could stop smoking at least four weeks, you had a, mm, a lower chance of a post-operative pulmonary complication. But, but and the longer you stop smoking, the better your outcome usually will be. But there was not actually a limit of saying that somebody cannot undergo operations, just understanding their risk factor. But the recommendation is at least still trying to be four weeks uh, free of um, smoking before you would recommend them undergo any kind of operation. Um, true, oh man, is it right? Okay, so you know the answer. So <laughs> preoperative antibiotics should be administered to all patients with pulmonary disorders. Pause. So what she should do is just the same thing with history, history, history. So if people have signs of an infection, you'll treat it as any other way. You will, they, they may have be at an increased risk of having post-operative complications, so you will treat that infection, see how they're doing, and then have them proceed with the surgery. So it's more just common sense. Um, true or false, COPD patients should be treated aggressively um, prior to the surgery. True. Um, so, if, like I said, if they're if they're in exacerbation, most of the, most of the what I realized from the stuff that I read is that it, a preoperative preoperative risk stratification is really kind of common sense. If somebody is, has an asthma exacerbation, they should not proceed with surgery, and you should make sure they're controlled. If somebody has a COPD exacerbation, treat their COPD, make sure it's controlled before you recommend anything. So, it's really trying to treat the underlying lung disease before you recommend them do anything else. Um, and uh, one of the things that I also noticed, and this is for asthma and COPD, is that patient, patients who are on at least 20 milligrams of prednisone per day um, for greater than three weeks in the previous six months, you should assume that they have a hypo hypothalamic pituitary adrenal um, dysfunction, and you should recommend at least stress fill steroids before the induction of anesthesiology to reduce the adverse effect of a potential adrenal insufficiency. Um, and they recommend that for both COPD and asthma, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, to give or to not give steroids, um, of course, like, like I said, routine administration of steroids and all asthmatics has not been shown to confer any confer better results. Although the same thing, if they have been on at least 20 milligrams or its equivalent, so if they're on DEXA or they're on um, hydrocortisone, if they're on the same equivalent over a period of um, three weeks for the last six months, then you should assume that they have adrenal dysfunction and you should give them steroids accordingly, stress those steroids before the operation. And of course, if they're not at their best step of therapy until you can get them to be controlled. And um, also don't forget something that um, if p some patients, you know, they have a um, aspirin phenotype, so some asthmatics have an aspirin phenotype, so just always remember that um, when we're talking about our patients, so you should avoid all intestines in these patients. Um, true or false, post-operative chest PT and inspiratory muscle trainers are beneficial in reducing post-operative pulmonary complication. True. So high-risk patients uh, who got breathing exercises, IMIS, and education to active breathing and forced expiration have shorter length of stay. So chest PT is like um, any kind of exercise and inspiratory training, uh, reduced um, post-op um, post adelectasis, pneumonia, and uh, length of stay. 
Um, so some intraoperative things you can do, you can recommend your, your anesthesiologist uh, use epidural over epidural spinal over general anesthesia if, you can, if they can. Um, shorter acting neuromuscular blockades. Um, um, of course, we know that that's a, a, a procedure-related risk factor, so we can recommend those. Um, if they could do a shorter surgery, if there's a chance between two surgeries and one is shorter, um, we re recommend that. And um, if they have to be on a ventilator, lung protective strategies um, will also be a benefit. Post-operatively, um, chest PT, um, deep breathing, IS, um, IPP, um, CPAP are all helpful in reducing um, post-operative pulmonary complications. Um, deep breathing exercises and inspiratory are equally effective. Um, um, pain control, um, epidural anesthesiology may be better at reducing um, post pulmonary complications than, um, than opioids. Um, and consider intranerval, intercostal nerve blocking to patients undergoing abdominal surgeries if possible. Um, so, so, some more things about OSA. So, Gupta and all they looked at, um, uh, they they looked at um, OSA and they showed that um, if you can do CPAP prior to surgery, it may decrease your uh, postoperative pulmonary complica uh, complications, length of stay, and infections. Although there's no randomized trial about the role of CPAP post-op, um, you can probably suggest that okay, this person has OSA, maybe they should. If they're going to be extubated, maybe extubate them to CPAP and just make sure they put them on CPAP at night. So some common things that we may overlook that we can also recommend. Um, some other things that further, uh, further reduce risk is to mi um, minimize opioids and benzos, consider, of course, uh, Tylenols, um, regional anesthesia, and um, continuous oxygenation post-op, early mobilization. And um, this is pretty much um, from up to date. It's pretty much talked about everything. I want to talk about some preoperative risk strategies, intraoperative risk strategies, and postoperative risk strategies that we pretty much want to introduce all about. Um, so pretty much a summary of assessment of our pulmonary risk, stepwise approach, uh, identify surgical risk factors, identify patient-related risk factors, um, take a complete, thorough history of physical um, and then we can use our risk stratified tools as needed. And then risk stratified patients. Take home message, if, you did, uh, if the patient is moderate to high risk for post pulmonary complications, <coughs> then try to implement risk reduction strategies. And for high risk patients, you need a way to risk of surgery and with uh, the risk and benefits. That's all I got. Questions? Mm -hmm.